Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome everybody. Ya Madad. We are live from Vancouver and Ottawa. Our webinar today is Women's Heart Health, a journey across the lifespan. I hope this will be an educational and an engaging session for you. I'm excited to have our special guest, Dr. Thais Coutinho cardiologist from the Ottawa Heart Institute with us here today. And we have another special guest as well, Dr. Munir Budwani, who is the chairman of the Aga Khan Health Board for Canada. So sit back, relax, enjoy your masala chai. And we will circle back to our favorite chai. Don't worry at the end, but enjoy your snack as well. And I trust it's a healthy one. Before we proceed though for the, uh, with the presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our volunteers who have helped us to implement this program, as well all the hundreds of other volunteers who have been working so tire tirelessly uh, throughout the pandemic to serve in many different capacities for the benefit of our Jamaat. So a heartfelt thank you to you all. My name is Dr. Shaheen Jaffer, and uh, I am really humbled to be able to moderate and be a co-presenter for today's session. I'm a clinical professor of medicine at the University of British Columbia and a specialist in internal medicine. I have expertise in cardiovascular health and diabetes. And with regard to women's heart health, I'm the founding chair of the Women's Heart and Brain Health Advocacy Committee of the Federation of Medical Women of Canada. I am a member of the Knowledge Translation and Mobilization Working Group of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance at the Ottawa Heart Institute. I am also a former board member of the BC Heart and Stroke Foundation. The objectives are as follows. By the end of pre this presentation, I'm hoping that you will have a much better understanding and awareness of women's heart and brain health across the lifespan. We will review inequities and challenges facing women in both these areas, and we will attempt to promote an understanding of the higher risk of complications and death in the South and Central Asian women population. I would like to remind the audience that any information that is provided in this webinar should not be considered medical advice and is not intended as a substitute for medical professional help, guidance, or diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you have regarding your medical care. This will be a multimedia presentation with slides, video, and some polling multiple choice questions. These questions will be anonymous, so we hope that all of you will participate freely. The presentation will be recorded and accessible online in a few days time. So if you have some family members or friends who cannot attend just now, please advise them so that they can view the uh, webinar at a later date. Post your questions as the webinar progresses on the questions tab on the GoToWebinar panel. And please do complete the survey and feedback form at the end that will be emailed to you. Lastly, we have two documents in the handouts tab that you can download during the presentation. And one is on um, the heart report and the other is the stroke report from the Heart and Stroke Foundation. It is now uh, my privilege and my honor to introduce to you Dr. Munir Budwani, who is the chairman of the Aga Khan Health Board for Canada. Dr. Budwani is professor of surgery at the University of Ottawa, 
and cardiovascular surgeon at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. He served on the Aga Khan Conciliation and Arbitration Board for Ontario in the past, and has also been on the Council for Canada as member for arts and culture. Welcome, Dr. Budwani. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jaffer, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, it is an absolute delight for me to be here with all of you today to launch this series of webinars on women's health. Um, I think that the importance of this series cannot be overstated. Uh, women's health represents an important area of focus, not only for the health board, uh, but also for society at large. We know that women's health issues affect our mothers, they affect our grandmothers, they affect our daughters, our aunts, our sisters. But importantly, the impact doesn't stop there. Um, as a society, we are all impacted when these issues uh, related to women's health remain unaddressed or incompletely or inequitably addressed. And while in 2020, it may seem completely normal for us to be having a conversation focusing on women's health, I think it's important to notice um, and uh, that historically women's health issues have been systematically not receiving the needed attention. Um, and as an example, when we look in the world of research in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and even now in some cases, um, women of childbearing age are deliberately excluded from clinical trials that are evaluating new medicines uh, for treatment of disease. Um, and while this is done to protect uh, the babies from harm, uh, they also uh, affect the kind of information we are able to or not able to get um, on how some of these treatments affect women and how impactful they are in women. And uh, it's also important to note that women's experience of health issues it, is unique at so many levels. Um, clearly, the biology uh, of uh, certain types of diseases is very different in women than it is in men. But the way in which diseases manifest in women, the way in which they are experienced by women, can be significantly different. And lastly, uh, the impact on society when a woman is affected by a particular disease can be completely different. And so all, at all three levels, at the biology, the individual experience, and at society, um, the experience of women health it can be dramatically different. Um, and so it is uh, very fitting that we have this uh, series of webinars on women's health. Um, we will be using this opportunity to shed some light on key issues affecting women's health today, uh, including areas of reproductive health, uh, of cancers, of navigation of the healthcare system. Um, but particularly, uh, today's topic is, uh, is uh, close to my heart, uh, pun intended. Uh, we are grateful here uh, to have with us uh, Dr. Shaheen Jaffer and Dr. Thais Coutinho, who will talk to us about uh, the experience of women uh, in cardiovascular disease and shedding some of, some light on um, the key ways in which um, you know women's experiences of, of these issues are are different um, and hopefully um, teach us all about some practical ways in which we can use this information uh, going forward. Um, so I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Jaffer and Dr. Coutinho for uh, for leading this area and uh, thank the audience for attending today. Thank you, Dr. Budwani. And it's now my uh, even greater honor and uh, greater privilege, no uh, offense, Chairman, uh, to introduce Dr. Thais Coutinho. Dr. Coutinho completed her medical school training in Brazil. In 2013, she did her residency and fellowship in cardiology, vascular medicine, advanced echocardiography, and research at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. She then joined the uh, University of Ottawa Heart Institute as a clinician scientist, and in 2017 was appointed chief of the Division of Cardiac Prevention and Rehabilitation and chair of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Center at the Ottawa Heart Institute. She's currently also associate professor of medicine at the University of Ottawa. She has been a speaker at multiple national and international meetings, and she has received numerous awards, including the Canadian Cardiovascular Society's Young Investigator Award in 2015. 
Dr. Coutinho has published her research in high impact journals in the field of cardiovascular diseases. And she was co-chair of the first and second Canadian Women's Heart Health Summits in 2016 and 2018. And the summit is the largest conference in the world dedicated exclusively to the cardiovascular health of women. And it was in 2018 that I met Dr. Coutinho in Ottawa, and we continue to work together with many other experts and advocates in the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance to advance best practices in women's cardiovascular health. And what I've shared with you just now is only a summary of her achievements. So without any further delay, I welcome Dr. Coutinho to our program. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaffer and Dr. Bodwani for this kind invitation for the excellent introduction. And it's truly a privilege to be here today uh, addressing this audience about a topic that is also very near and dear to my heart, also pun intended. All right. So once again, thank you very much for, for this invitation. Uh, today we'll be talking about women's heart health. That's a very broad topic in itself. So I chose a few aspects that I thought will be uh, most important for this audience to you know, raise awareness and improve their own health. And of course, we can address any, any questions at the end of the presentation. I have no disclosures for this presentation today. So I would like to start with a question and I'm going to run a poll and I would, I would give you a few seconds to vote. Um, and let me see, make sure that I can run this correctly. Okay, so I'm gonna launch, launch this poll now and I hope that all of you can vote. Uh, and you can choose if whether this is true or false. Breast cancer is the biggest threat to a woman's health. So is it true or is it false? I'll let you keep voting. I'll give you about 15 more seconds and then we'll, um, we'll see what everybody thinks. Okay, so I think 70% have voted. So I will go ahead and share the results. So let's see. So it's a fairly even split, uh, understanding that there is some bias here. Of course, we're here to talk about women's heart health. So, you know, you have to understand that that's, that's kind of the reason behind this question. But, uh, you know, about half of you think this is true, about half of you think this is false. You're actually do already doing better than the majority of Canadians. So let me share uh, the answer with you. Um, just need to take this poll out of my view. There we go. Very good. So the truth is the far majority of people out there, men or women, believe that breast cancer is a woman's greatest health threat. This is indeed a myth. It is not correct. The reality is that heart disease or cardiovascular diseases, diseases that affect the heart and the blood vessels, and that also includes stroke, they are the number one killers of women worldwide. And cardiovascular diseases actually kill five times as many women as breast cancer does. This is an important uh, uh, notion that not everybody is aware of. And in fact, research from our own group at the Ottawa Heart Institute demonstrates that only 13% of Canadian women actually identify heart disease as their greatest health threat. So the very, you know, very initial important point here is to make people understand or help people understand that you know, it, you know, from all the possible diseases that could affect a woman, heart disease is at the top of the list. But the good news about this, however, is that 80% of the time, cardiovascular diseases can be prevented. So even though it is a threat to our health, it is something that we can actually actively work on in hopes of trying to prevent uh, these outcomes. So this is the slide that I was referring to, that, that, that there's a myth about breast cancer being the greatest threat to women's health. And the reality is that not, um, heart disease is the number one killer, with only 13% of Canadian women identifying heart disease as the greatest health threat. And as uh, Dr. Jaffer and Dr. Bodwani were mentioning already in their introductory uh, speeches, heart disease and brain diseases in women remain understudied, underdiagnosed, undertreated, and undersupported. And this is why so many of us are working so hard in this field to really remove all of these unders from uh, the, the theme of cardiovascular disease in women. 
actually, if you went back to the 1950s, which is not that long ago, if you think about that, and you were trying to find any information on heart attacks for women, the only information we could find, and this is not a joke, this is reality, was a brochure entitled How to Help Your Husband Recover from a Heart Attack. The truth is that back at that time, and, and that's the thought that still prevails even to this day, is that it was believed that women could not have heart disease, that women were protected against heart disease and only men would have heart disease. And nowadays in 2020, we fully understand that women has as high of a risk for heart disease as men. The risk is it just varies across the lifespan. Um, although not everybody knows this yet, but it's very interesting to go back just a few years ago and realize how far we've come in terms of information and knowledge. So to get to the, the, the meat of this talk, I wanted to address uh, risk factors with you because like I said earlier, even though heart, cardiovascular diseases are the number one killers of women in the world, differently than many other kinds of diseases, we can prevent cardiovascular disease 80% of the time. And I say 80% of the time because cardiovascular diseases are not just um, environment, right? They're not just lifestyle. They are a combination of lifestyle with genetics, and we cannot fight genetics. We can only adjust lifestyle and risk factors. So understanding the risk factors is very important for all of us, so we can actually know where we stand when it comes to risk factors and definitely control them. So let's start uh, the discussion about what we call the conventional risk factors. These are things that I think most of you may have heard about in terms of being a risk for cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, etc. The important piece here is that these conventional risk factors actually do affect women differently than they affect men. And here are some examples. High blood pressure, which is, by the way, the number one cause of death and disability worldwide. It is actually a more potent risk factor for heart disease in women. It is more common in older women after the age of 50 as compared to men, and it contributes to heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, and death in a greater fashion than it contributes to these events in men. Uh, so that's an important comparison. The other important risk factor to discuss is diabetes. Diabetes is also a well-known risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It increases the risk for heart attacks and strokes, for example, in everybody, but this, the magnitude of this increase is also higher in women. It increases the risk three to seven fold in women as compared to two to three fold in men. Smoking is the number one cause of preventable death and hospitalization in the world. Very important risk factor for heart disease and many other diseases, um, but again, affect women differently. Uh, younger women in experience an increase in the risk for heart attack that is 60% higher than smoking men experience. So it's also a more potent uh, risk factor. And it also importantly, women have more difficulty uh, quitting smoking and remaining quit uh, from tobacco uh, once they, they, they try the first attempts at quitting. So it's a problem also for women. Other conventional risk factors include physical activity. So uh, physical inactivity, which is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, is more common in women than in men. And as a result, obesity. Obesity is important uh, in terms of uh, a risk factor for heart disease in men and women. However, it increases the risk for heart disease by 64% in women as compared to 46% in men. So again, all of these conventional risk factors tend to affect women in an even more negative way than they affect men. And then I just discussed the conventional risk factors, but then we have to think about what we call the female specific risk factors. What are these things? These are risk factors that only a woman would experience in their lifetime. They will not affect men. But for the women that do experience these conditions, they actually do signal a higher risk for heart disease and stroke in the future as well. So here are some examples of female specific risk factors. Starting with the polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, this is a fairly common condition that many young women um, um, uh, have. Uh, and what many people don't know is that women that have PCOS do have a small increase in the risk for cardiovascular disease, mainly due to alterations in their metabolics and insulin resistance and so forth. Um, in addition to that, menopause, it's a very important time in the life of a woman, very important transition. 
uh, if you actually look at curves, epidemiology curves, and you look at the incidence or the, the, the number of heart attacks and strokes every year through our, woman, through our woman's reproductive life, women seem to have a protection as compared to men. However, around the age of 50 or so, which is the average age of menopause, the tables turn. This protection that women did enjoy throughout their reproductive life is removed and the risk for cardiovascular disease and the predominance or the prevalence of the cardiovascular risk factors do increase quite steeply in women after menopause and that protection is then removed. Importantly, for women that experience early menopause, which is defined as menopause at the age of 40 or earlier, these women experience a 95% higher risk of a future heart attack. Other female-specific risk factors pertain to the time of the pregnancy. So we like to say in cardiology that a pregnancy is a woman's first stress test. There are so many hemodynamic changes that occur in the woman's body that if there are any predispositions to cardiovascular disease that the woman may already have, sometimes there's a red flag that is raised at the time of the pregnancy. So here I have for you an example all of some of the cardiovascular risks associated with what we call hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So what are these hypertensive disorders of pregnancy? These are the situations when a woman's blood pressure goes up and becomes high over 140 over 90 during the pregnancy. This can be gestational hypertension, which is high blood pressure during pregnancy, or it can be preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure during pregnancy, but also associated with organ damage, such as damage at the level of the kidneys and brain or in the blood uh, cells and so forth. These conditions are not rare. They affect five to 10% of all pregnancies. But what happens many times is after the baby is born and the placenta is delivered, um, the preeclampsia uh, resolves and may, very, very often the blood pressure normalizes with time as well. So the women that experience these conditions, they seem to think, okay, so that was a chapter in the book of my life. That's a page I have now turned. Now I'm starting afresh. And many physicians actually think the same too, that the history of preeclampsia stays in the past and then nothing uh, carries over. But that's uh, an erroneous uh, belief. Uh, what we do now know is that these hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, uh, they carry a significant risk, increase in the risk for cardiovascular disease in the future. And here are some examples. A woman who has had preeclampsia, for example, experiences about a 370% increase in the risk of having chronic high blood pressure for the rest of her life. And hypertension, as we mentioned, is a very prominent risk factor for other cardiovascular diseases. The risk of stroke in the future increases by 81%. The risk of atrial arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation and others, increase by 50%. Heart failure risk in the future increases by 400%. The risk for heart attack, coronary artery disease, is 250% higher. The risk for more death from any cause is 50% higher. And the risk of death due to cardiovascular diseases is 221% higher in the future. Now, these numbers are very scary. And uh, I see that we have about 150 members in this audience today. So invariably, some of you in the audience will have had this condition. And in my experience, people get very spooked uh, when I speak about this. But what I always tell my patients is that these numbers are not a fate. They are a risk. It's important to know what the risk is so you can take control of that risk. It is not a fate. It doesn't mean that you will have it. But compared to, for example, your twin sister that may have not had a hypertensive disorder or pregnancy, these increased risks apply, and it's important to know them and take care of uh, your risk factors. <clears throat> there are other conditions around the time of the pregnancy that also highlight a higher risk in, of cardiovascular disease in the future. For example, gestational diabetes, which is diabetes that develops at the time of pregnancy, lead to a 70 to 100% higher risk of future cardiovascular diseases. And most of this risk is mediated by the development of, quote, regular diabetes mellitus later in life, the, the, the usual type 2 diabetes later in life. Uh, if a person has had a placental abruption, the odds of cardiovascular disease are increased by 82%. 
if they had a premature delivery, the baby was born before 37 weeks. Cardiovascular disease risk in the future is 63% higher. And if there has been a stillbirth, the baby was uh, did not survive uh, the pregnancy, uh, cardiovascular disease risk increases by 42%. So these are all conditions that make us clinicians raise our antennas in terms of trying to identify a higher risk individual, uh, somebody who we need to work with early on to really mitigate this cardiovascular risk and improve their odds of not having heart attack, strokes, and heart failure in the future. So I'm going to now launch my second poll, and I hope I can do it correctly this time. Uh, so here is my second question for you. It relates to preeclampsia. I just showed you and just uh, mentioned that uh, preeclampsia increases a woman's future risk for heart, heart attacks and strokes and other types of heart disease. So what do you think is the average age at the time of the first heart attack or stroke for a woman who have, has a history of preeclampsia? In other words, a woman has had a preeclampsia today, then in the future she eventually develops a heart attack or a stroke. What is the average age that this happens? Is it 38 years old, 48, 58, 68, or 78 years old for a woman with preeclampsia? So I'll let you vote and I'll give you some time. This is a little bit more complex question than the first. And we'll see uh, what the what the group thinks. So about fifty percent of you have voted. I'm going to wait a little, just a little bit longer for more votes to come in. I'll give you five more seconds. All right. So let's launch the poll. So it seems that the majority of you think that 48 years old is the age at the time of the first heart attack. And the second most common answer here was 58 years old. Um, I, so this poll, it, what, we're, what I'm seeing here is that you're skewing towards a younger age group, which is correct. The correct answer is actually 38 years old. So it is really an eye opener. So women with preeclampsia who do go on to have a heart attack or stroke have their first event at an average age of 38 years old. I'm gonna hide results here. Are you able to see me? I hope so. If we cannot, if you cannot see my slides, please speak up. Uh, so it is definitely a, a very young age, and you know I am 38 years old myself, and I cannot even imagine. Um, having a heart attack or a stroke at this age, it's a really, a really uh, eye-opener to many of us. The other important risk factor that is female-specific that we have to talk about is breast cancer. Now, this could be an entire talk in itself about the intersections between breast cancer and heart disease. It is very interesting that so many of the risk factors for heart disease are also risk factors for breast cancer. And many things that we do to prevent heart disease also help prevent breast cancer. But uh, that's not the point I wanted to make today. The point that I wanted to make is that a woman who has had breast cancer actually have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, sometimes depending on the therapy they received. And actually heart disease is the number one killer of breast cancer survivors, uh, which is an interesting, if a woman survives breast cancer, heart disease is, is the, usually the cause of death later on. So some women back in the 70s, 80s uh, with breast cancer used to receive much higher doses of radiation to the breast compared to the doses that we use today. We didn't know back then that the ionizing radiation could be damaging to the heart. So some of these women that receive very high dose of radiation to the chest due to breast cancer and other kinds of chest malignancies, uh, you know, back you know several decades ago, they have higher risk of heart disease that can affect all of the layers of the heart. It can affect the sac around the heart, the pericardium. It can affect the heart muscle and weaken it. It can affect the valves and cause them to be dysfunctional. And it can also affect the arteries and cause them to harden and form plaque and cause a heart attack. The other part of this is the chemotherapy. There are chemotherapy agents that are still widely used to this day in uh, the treatment of breast cancer that can weaken the heart. Knowledge of this, of course, have led to modifications of the chemotherapy protocols to try to minimize this and, of course, very close monitoring of the patients. But some of the chemo agents may weaken the heart, making it less efficient to pump blood. 
So women with, that have already pre-existing risk factors for heart disease are indeed a greater risk of having heart damage as a result of their chemotherapy. So that's another female specific risk factor. And of course, I couldn't uh, 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 skip of, uh, addressing the issue of ethnicity, especially to this audience, because being South Asian is also associated with higher risk for cardiovascular disease. And I will preface to say that the data I present here is mostly for men and women. The sex-specific data is not as abundant for South Asian women uh, uh, as it is uh, for other ethnic groups. But the data that I'm presenting here is uh, presenting here is actually mostly from Canada, so applicable to to many, if not all of you, here in the audience. So what we do know is that South Asian Canadians are about 2.5 times more likely to be diabetic than white Canadians. And I have actually, I was reading a little bit about this and there's some thought, although the true mechanism is not fully known, but there is some thought that perhaps you take an individual that may already have a genetic predisposition and then you expose this person that may be genetically predisposed to diabetes to the more westernized lifestyle and diet, sedentarism, etc. And that combination may actually significantly increase the risk of diabetes in the South Asian population. Uh, South Asians also have a more adverse blood lipid profile. So when we check the cholesterol levels and other blood fats, we notice that South Asians tend to have lower levels of the protective good cholesterol called HDL. They tend to have higher levels of a different kind of blood fat called triglycerides that also contributes to the deposit of plaques in arteries. And there's some studies, not, not everybody has agreed on this, but there are some studies to show that South Asians uh, may have a higher concentration of a particular kind of uh, lipoprotein in the blood called lipoprotein little a, which actually promotes the plaque buildup in a more intense way. So there are some differences in the blood lipid or blood fat profile of South Asian individuals that may also predispose them to heart disease. The other point here is that South Asian Canadians have increased body fat percentage. So if you take a South Asian Canadian and a white Canadian with the same weight, the South Asian Canadian typically has more body fat percentage. And this is specific to women. South Asian Canadian women have greater levels of abdominal obesity, which is fat that accumulates around the waist as compared to white Canadian women of the same weight. And we know that the abdominal obesity is the detrimental one. The, the fat that accumulates in the waist are much more uh, metabolically adverse and has a higher risk uh, or, or leads to a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. The other point here is that South Asian Canadians have about 11% higher risk of developing high blood pressure as compared to white Canadians and tend to develop hypertension or high blood pressure at a younger age. So as a result, if you do a count, if you take a look at Canadians and count how many South Asian Canadians have already had a heart disease or stroke and you match that to the actual count of Canadians of European ancestry of the same set, age and sex, uh, and look how many of those have had heart attack and strokes. What you see is that South Asian Canadians have about 51% higher prevalence of heart disease and stroke. So that's an important risk factor too that everybody needs to, to consider, including us clinicians, as we try to understand a person's risk and help them really mitigate those risks. So that's what I had to say about risk factors. I'll move on now to symptoms of heart disease, which we, there are so many things to talk about and so many potential differences that have been discussed and reported in women. And I thought it would be important to address here today as well. So with that, I'm going to start this section about symptoms with a video. It started out like a totally normal day. Okay, move objection deadline to the third line after survey. Oh, honey, for, for when you you always use the verb star. What are you doing down there? Did you finish your breakfast? Ow. Whew. Don't hit your brother. I mean, you have to eat something. Here. Okay, five minutes to carpool. Where's my coffee? Mm. You okay, Mom? Oh, I'm fine. Sandwich orders. What do you want? Almond butter and jelly. Spaghetti. Oh, you sure you're okay? I'm fine, sweetie. 
I am so late. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Hey, honey. You okay? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. You sure? Oh, yeah. Here. Acai, my favorite. See you guys later. Where are your shoes? Put your shoes back on, please. You know, go help your sister. We're going in three minutes. Oh, my God, what am I doing? I forgot to cut off the crust. Voila! Shoes on, potty if you need it. Honey, get your sister. Okay, get your shoes. Nobody move! I'm getting a dustpan. Oh. Mom! Mm. I think you're having a heart attack. Honey, do I look like the type of person who has a heart attack? <laughs> I'm just gonna sit down. <sighs> I'm totally fine. Don't forget to wear the high socks with the shin guards. Forget about the shin guards, Mom. <gasps> Come on, Mrs. Onadonk is not gonna wait. I'm sorry to bother you. <laughs> I think I might be having a little heart attack. <laughs> Nothing really, just some nausea, tightening of the jaw, dizziness, shortness of breath, muscle pain, achiness, this terrible pressure in my chest. Oh, really? They can be here in how long? <gasps> Two minutes. Can you make it 10? I thought I had gas. Turns out, I was having a heart attack. Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. So that video is such a great example. It was done in a very humorous way, but it actually really depicts the reality of so many women with heart disease. The lack of understanding that their symptoms represent heart disease. This denial that I shouldn't be having a heart attack. I'm a woman, I'm a young woman, I'm a healthy woman. Um, I, I, it doesn't fight, it doesn't sound right. Or this notion that you must take care of everybody else first before you take care of yourself. So there are so many truths that are being here depicted in a very humorous way, but you know, for it's actually the reality for many, many women uh, with heart disease. So that's a good introduction to our, the part of the talk about symptoms, because just as you can already see from this video, early heart attack signs can be missed in up to 78% of women. They can pass on their symptoms as gas, just like shown in this video, or indigestion, or something else. So it's important to be aware of symptoms. So with that in mind, uh, what does the textbook say about the symptoms of a heart attack or a threatened heart attack? If you take the books that you know, Dr. Jaffer and Dr. Bodwani and myself and uh, many have many have read and studied in medical school, the books will say that a heart attack would present itself with a heaviness right behind the breastbone that may radiate to the jaw and or the left arm that is usually brought on by exertion, usually relieved by rest or nitroglycerin spray. The problem is these books were written on studies from 50 years ago plus that included only men. And that that's been the time where people didn't think women could have heart attacks, uh, women were not included in research. So the description we have in our textbooks is a good description that very often fits how men present with a heart attack, but may or may not fit how women present with a heart attack. So what else can happen in real life? Women can sure have any of these classic textbook symptoms, and I've seen many women with them, but they can also have a chest pain that feels like a burning or sharp or a dull feeling or indigestion. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard women say indigestion, but deep inside, they know it's not indigestion. They have felt indigestion before, and indigestion is the best word sometimes they can come up with to explain what they're feeling, but they know this is not indigestion. So it's it's very interesting to to under, to, to hear how the the woman describes it and and try to to draw these parallels. Uh, sometimes the pain can be right at the top of the stomach here, or sometimes it can be just in the neck or just in the jaw or in the arm. I've also seen uh, women present with these conditions. Um, the pain, sure, can happen during exercise, but it can also occur due to emotional stress or anxiety. Or sometimes the women may have just shortness of breath or just nausea or just a profound feeling of exhaustion. 
So none of these things are described in our books because the books did not include women uh, when they came up with the descriptions. And it's something that we're learning every day. I always remain very humble every time I see women with any kind of chest symptom because I feel like I'm always learning from them because I have to learn from them because the books won't teach me. So over time, there has been this notion that men with heart attack or men with heart disease have typical symptoms, meaning that it's like our textbook. And women with heart disease have atypical symptoms because they're not like the textbook. Many of you may have heard these, uh, these terms before. Certainly all of us here in healthcare have heard these terms. And I will ask you to refrain from using these terms because uh, using the word atypical truly marginalizes a woman's experience and the woman's health, in fact. And the, the only reason they are not typical is because women were not studied to begin with. Um, so it's much better to think about patterns, about male patterns of heart disease, female patterns of heart disease, rather than this, this um, uh, wording of typical and atypical. The other uh, notion that seems to be very prevalent in the medical community and beyond is that, oh, women with heart attacks don't have chest pain. They, they present with something else. Uh, and there have been now many studies that have debunked this notion. And here I show you one of such studies. Um, if you look at the table to the left, they look at many patients, uh, 2,000 women and almost 1,000 men that had a heart attack, and they found the symptoms they presented with. So as you can see here, women, 87% of women presented with chest discomfort uh, as compared to 89% of men. So that was very similar. So the conclusion here is women are as likely as men to present with pain in the chest. And, and the far majority of men and women do so. What seems to be different between men and women is that women are more likely than men to have three, four, or more additional symptoms on top of the chest pain at the time of the heart attack. So for example, perhaps a man comes with chest pain and shortness of breath. A woman may come with chest pain, shortness of breath, confusion, sweating, palpitations, and a headache, for example. So women are more likely than men to have this very complex, plethoric, uh, symptomatic um, description, uh, which actually causes confusion. The woman herself may think, well, if I'm having a headache and shortness of breath, and something else, maybe this is something else. And the physician or the nurse on the other side may also get confused. So that seems to be one of the major differences between men and women. It's not about the chest pain itself, but perhaps the other features that surround the chest pain at the time of the presentation. So pay attention to that as well. The other uh, point that I also wanted to highlight, which I spoke earlier about this, this notion of typical and atypical symptoms. And this study that was presented last year at the European Society of Cardiology called the Hermes study, I thought it was so interesting because it really helps us say goodbye to this notion of typical and atypical. So what did they do in this study? They, uh, they took 637 patients that were referred to a coronary angiogram, which is an invasive study that is the gold standard to diagnose blockages in the heart arteries. They then recorded a conversation between the patient and the physician, and they took their recording and they gave it to a computer that analyzed the language through artificial intelligence. And what the computer reported is that, first of all, 90% of both men and women presented for, the, for their coronary angiogram report a chest pain as a symptom, which is very much in line with all other studies of this topic, saying that about 90% of women and women, men and women have chest pain. But importantly, the computer identified nine clusters of symptoms uh, that led them to this angiogram, but there was no difference in these clusters of symptoms between men and women. So in other words, what is the conclusion here? The conclusion here is that if you let a computer listen to the patient, the computer will tell you men and women present similarly with heart disease. If you let a human listen to the patient, the human will say men are typical, women are atypical, or they are different. All of us, and I'm one of them, anybody has their own intrinsic biases. There are things that you have learned or experienced in your life the form of intrinsic biases, and that shapes your experience and your interactions. So it, I thought it was an eye-opening study that really, uh, really uh, is really humbling for us uh, clinicians to understand that we have to free ourselves 
from this bias to be able to fully understand uh, the symptomatic uh, complaints of women with heart disease. Now, uh, moving on to chest pain triggers, which is also a point of contention so many times uh, clinically. The textbook will tell us that true angina, and angina is the medical name for a chest pain that is caused by poor blood flow to the heart. Uh, the textbook will say that true angina is brought on by exertion and relieved by rest. However, what we see in real life in women more commonly than men, that chest pain can indeed also be caused by emotional stress or anxiety. This stress or anxiety, this mental health trigger, it's more likely to occur in women than in men. And very often uh, the symptoms are attributed to depression, anxiety, or all in her head. I have seen number, a number of women who truly believe that their symptoms are all in their head because they have a history of anxiety. And I've also, I've also seen women whose physicians believe so because of the, 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 uh, the, the patient's history of anxiety or depression, they think that this is all kind of a somatic manifestation of the psychiatric disease. But I will show you direct evidence in the contrary, that this is not the case. This is a real, real trigger. So here's a very elegant study from our colleagues uh, in Atlanta, in the United States, that really show that mental, uh, mental stress and emotional distress can indeed be a trigger for, for chest pain and heart disease. So they took 360, 306 patients that had a recent heart attack. So these are people with documented coronary artery disease or blockages in the heart arteries. 50% of them were women. So it was a good split uh, of the sample. In, interestingly, even though all of the patients had a heart attack, women had less severe and less extensive coronary artery blockages than men. And then what did they do? So they waited several months after the heart attack and everybody was stable, and they administered a mental stress test. And you may wonder what a mental stress test is. So basically, it's not even that stressful, but they tell the patients, say, hey, listen, you have three minutes to prepare a five minute talk on topic X, and they'll come up with any topic. So it, it, they just have to get up, think about this, and deliver a speech about that topic in the heartbeat. So that is even not even as stressful as real life, to be honest, but that is enough to cause a little bit of stress in people. So after they did this mental stress test, they put them in the nuclear stress test camera where they can actually quantify the blood flow to the heart. And what they found is that women were three times more likely than men to have demonstrable decreases in the blood flow to the heart on the imaging study as a result of this very simple mental stress test. So mental stress is indeed a prominent trigger for chest pain that is truly caused by poor blood flow to the heart. And this is more common in women than men. Now, the other part uh, that I wanted to discuss are differences in the mechanisms of heart attack, because not all heart attacks are created equal. Here we have the textbook heart attack, and this you don't have to be a clinician to see this coronary angiogram and see this very severe blockage in the coronary artery here, 90%. If somebody comes in with chest pain, they have this angiogram, anybody can see, they will be treated right away, no questions asked. However, not everybody has a heart attack presenting just like that. What we see in real life is that there are many people, and more so women than men, that can have a heart attack despite apparently normal coronary arteries. And this is an angiogram of a woman who was having a heart attack. And if you look at these coronaries, you will see there is absolutely nothing wrong with them. They are beautiful and wide open. So many people, especially women, will have chest pain. They will come in, they'll be diagnosed with a heart attack or a threatened heart attack. They will have an, a coronary angiogram as shown here, and it will be, quote, normal. And then they will say, okay, this must be Due to something else. This may be maybe some you know, uh, gastric reflux or something else. Um, but it's no, it's well known now that heart attacks can happen with apparently normal coronary arteries. And there's a name for this. It's called MINOCA. MINOCA stands for myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. And, with, and people with MINOCA tends to, tend to be younger. They tend to be usually the average age of 58 years old. They're more commonly women than men, and they're less likely to have abnormalities in the blood levels of cholesterol 
uh, predisposing them to this heart attack. So this can occur. So why is it though? Well, how can somebody have a heart attack or even chest pain if their arteries are quote normal? That's because the arteries are not normal. They may just look normal. So here I have some examples for you, and I know this can be daunting, but I will explain, uh, I'll walk you through it. This is a study from our colleagues in New York. They took 50 women with Minoca. They had a heart attack, but they had apparently normal arteries on the angiogram. So as you can see in these angiograms, the arteries look absolutely normal, but they put a catheter inside the artery. It's an ultrasound catheter called IVUS that can see the, the inside of the arterial wall from inside of the artery. So if you think of the coronary artery as a straw and you're looking down the straw, this is what we're looking at in these pictures. And focus on the pictures on the right that have the orange lines. So the very middle of the, of the picture here is the actual catheter. The dark gray is the blood inside the blood vessel, you know, just the blood flowing through. And the light gray is the plaque. So even though these arteries look normal in the angiogram, when you did the intravascular ultrasound, you can see that there was indeed a crescentic shaped plaque in all of these women. And this plaque was not obstructive. You can see the lumen of the artery is still wide open. Lots of blood flow can go through. But these plaques are disrupted. This plaque has a fracture right here. This plaque has a fracture right here. And this plaque has an erosion right here. It looks like a bite was taken off the plaque. So plaque disruption can cause heart attacks, but you will not see this with conventional angiography. So that's another mechanism for heart attacks that are more common in women than men. And the other mechanism for heart attacks with apparently normal arteries are due to microvascular dysfunction. So when we do the coronary angiogram, we only see these large coronary arteries here. What we don't see is this very vast, complex web of microvessels that control the blood flow to the heart muscle just the same. We don't see them. These mini vessels here, they're smaller than a hair or thinner than a hair. They have muscle in the wall. And that muscle can contract and relax. And by doing so, it, it controls the blood flow that reaches the heart muscle. So if there's any dysfunction in this control of the vascular tone, uh, people can have a heart attack too, despite the fact that the, the big arteries look quite open. And this is how I like to explain this to my patients to make it very simple. To get home, you need to take the highway, which is your large epicardial coronary arteries. But then at some point, you need to take a side road to get to your house, right? The side row is the microvascular, uh, is the microvasculature. So if you have wide open arteries, wide open microvasculature, you can go right home, no problem. On the other hand, if you have a blockage in the main highway, the epicardial coronary arteries, if you are in a helicopter giving a report to the radio station, you will see that blockage and you report that traffic jam, right? So that's a conventional heart attack. However, some people may have a wide open highway, but then when you take the side road to get to your house, here is just a funny example. There's a whole bunch of cows on the road and you cannot get home. Even though the radio report may say, oh, the everything looks wide open, you still cannot get to your house. So it's, it's still a problem. And that's a, a funny concept to illustrate the concept of microvascular disease and how it can also interrupt the blood flow to the heart muscle. The other mechanism that I'll very briefly mention, because that's also a talk in itself, that can lead to a heart attack is something that is called spontaneous coronary artery dissection. This is a, a long name to say that it is a tear, a spontaneous tear in the wall of the heart arteries that occur in, in women most of the time. 90% of patients with this condition are women. Many of them are younger women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and they're usually women with no other cardiovascular risk factors. They're usually the picture of health, and they can have a heart attack. So the heart attack can still occur in younger, healthier, healthier women as a result of coronary artery dissection, and this is much, much more common in women than it is in men. And to finalize, I wanted to also point out some sex differences in the treatment and the prognosis of heart disease and heart attacks. So even if a woman recognizes her symptoms, she presents to the doctor or to the emergency room, she gets her heart attack diagnosed, even then from that point on, there are still sex differences. Women during or after a heart attack, they are less likely than men to receive anticoagulants, which is standard treatment. 
they are less likely to have the culprit artery reopen in a timely fashion. Timely fashion. They are less likely to have their heart function checked, less likely to be referred for a coronary angiogram, less likely to receive stents or bypass surgery to recanalize the blood flow down to the heart muscle, and they're less likely to be discharged on guideline-based medications that are recommended for all patients with a heart attack. So there's still a lot of ground to cover to really make sure they were providing women with as good of a treatment as we provide to men. And as a result of this, uh, I'm going to help you interpret this graphic. These are the trends in 30-day mortality after a heart attack. So you have the, year, the ears here uh, on the x-axis. And as you can see, in both men and women, men are shown in green and red, black men and white men, and women are shown in blue and orange, black women and orange women. The heart attack mortality rates have totally decreased in both men and women over time, which is excellent news. But not so excellent news is the fact that still up to 2010, when the study uh, did the, the, the study published in 2014, did the last evaluation, mortality rates after heart attack was still higher in women, black and white, as compared to men, black, uh, black and white men. Uh, if you extend this follow-up a little further, closer to current dates, this gap has continued to narrow, but it's still there. So we certainly still have work to do. The other important point is that even though cardiac rehabilitation is recommended to all patients after a heart attack or a heart event, as it helps them get back on their feet, address the risk factors, and decrease the risk of a re reoccurrence of the heart attack and rehospitalization, despite all of these benefits, women are 50% less likely than men to participate in cardiac rehabilitation. There are many reasons for this that I'm happy to discuss, but it's also something that we have. We're always constantly trying to address to make sure women are receiving this very important therapy after a heart attack as much as men are. So with that, I'll leave you here with this notion that there are male and female patterns of heart disease. And here are some things that I wanted to leave with you. For the ones of you in the audience who are women, I really want you to know what your risk factors are and work with your doctor to manage them. I want you to understand what are the possible symptoms of a heart, at of a heart attack. And do not delay care if you are concerned about your heart or brain. I didn't talk about brain because there was no time, but if there's any concern, that what, you could, what you're feeling could be heart attack or stroke, do not delay care. And for the ones of you in the audience who are men, use this information to help raise awareness to heart disease in women and be advocates for the women in your lives. Everybody has a woman in their life. Uh, help them and encourage them to maintain healthy habits, to maintain good risk factor control, encourage them to seek medical care if they are concerned about their symptoms. So with that, I will leave you here with this um, with this plug for our February 13 Wear Red Canada, which is our annual campaign to raise awareness for heart disease in women. And I'll pass it on back to Dr. Jeffer, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'll be able to take any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Coutinho. That was just such an eloquent presentation, and I'm sure uh, the audience found it very, very insightful. Thank you so much. Thank you. We uh, continue to have a high level of participation, so um, I will go ahead uh, with um, the uh, aspect about women's brain health, And although Dr. Coutinho covered a little bit, and then I'll present a few more details about heart health in South and Central Asians. So, um, you know, the general population uh, is rather ill-informed about the burden of brain disease in our uh, population. For example, a woman in Canada has a stroke every 17 minutes. So in the time that this presentation occurs, uh, four women will have had a stroke, and one-fifth of those uh, patients will die of their stroke. The burden of stroke is highest in elderly women, and high blood pressure is the number one risk factor for stroke. Women unfortunately have worse outcomes compared to men. More women than men die of stroke, and women are 60% less likely to regain independence after suffering a stroke in terms of their activities of daily living. Almost twice as many women as men go to long-term care, and so you can see that overall, women have a worse quality of life after stroke when compared to men. 
In terms of the risk factors, the conventional or traditional risk factors are exactly the same as that for heart disease. So smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, being overweight or obese, being physically inactive, having an unhealthy diet, uh, one that is low in fresh fruits and fresh vegetables, high cholesterol and psychosocial factors as Dr. Coutinho has so brilliantly presented, such as anxiety and depression, are all very important um, for the development of stroke. Now, in terms of gender-specific risk factors, pregnancy uh, is important. And it's known that stroke in pregnancy happens three times higher than in non-pregnant women of the same age. But I must emphasize that the overall risk is very low. Just like pregnancy is a woman's first stress test, I would add that is also the first stress test for the brain. So these are the symptoms you've seen on the commercials on TV regarding stroke, and they're worth repeating. It's the FAST mnemonic, F-A-S-T. So if you think somebody is having a stroke, check to see if one side of their face, particularly around their lower face and their lips, is drooping to one side. Ask the person if they can raise both their arms. And if they're having a stroke, they might not be able to raise one arm as high as the other. The one arm will be weaker. Try and notice if the person's speech is jumbled or slurred. And if any of these symptoms are present, please call 911 right away. Because the quicker you get to the emergency department, the less risk is of your brain cells dying. And the prognosis for recovery is much, much better. Now, in men and women, the one-sided numbness and weakness is the same in terms of how people present with stroke. However, over 50% of women also have changes in their mental status, i.e., in addition to the weakness, they will have either confusion or disorientation. Unfortunately, young women take nine hours to arrive to the hospital if they're having a stroke. And it's not much better for older men and women. It takes them seven and a half hours to seek medical attention. And I would highly recommend if anybody thinks they're having a stroke, please get to the emergency department right away, within one hour if possible. Because when you think about the number of tests that have to be done, the CT scan, really you want to, everything to be available within three hours so that you can receive the clot busting treatment to open up of blocked arteries in the brain, if that is uh, what is indicated. In terms of the heart and brain burden in South and Central Asians, it's important to realize that South Asians are actually now the largest visible minority in Canada. And in both men and women, we have the highest rates of heart disease, high blood pressure, and stroke compared to other ethnic groups. And deaths due to heart attack and stroke occur five to 10 years earlier than the Caucasian population. As Dr. Coutinho mentioned, uh, diabetes uh, it occurs at about 200% more, a twofold higher risk is present in South Asians. And South Asian women develop diabetes and high cholesterol. Again, it bears repeating. Uh, they develop that at a much lower body weight compared to other ethnic groups and Caucasians. There isn't uh, very much literature at all, unfortunately, about Central Asians in Canada. However, when you look at the medical literature from Central Asia, so you know Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, the heart disease and stroke rates are major causes as well of premature death. And they have a high burden of risk factors similar to North American Canadians. What is really um, important uh, and uh, critical, in fact, to realize is that, as this study shows from 2014, these are children, adolescents, and young adults in British Columbia. And you can see that between the ages here on the bottom, the ages of 20 to 20, so 20 to 30, the risk of diabetes in South Asians is almost three to four fold higher in South Asians compared to Chinese and white populations. So the message here is screen early for diabetes and also for high cholesterol, which is what the 2016 cholesterol guidelines recommend. If you're at high risk, like South Asian, uh, please 
have your family doctor check your cholesterol profile if you're under the age of 40. Well, we've now reached the discussion and question and answer time. And um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask uh, Dr. Coutinho. Actually, she may have already answered this question. Let's see what she has to say. This is the Chai connection that I had actually alluded to uh, earlier. When I was preparing for this talk, I wanted to find a map of the world. And I happened to find this one, which is actually the continents and the different countries across the world have been took, put together with pictures of dried herbal teas. So that was, you know, something that I thought, wow, we have our mixed spice masala tea. So when we came from uh, India, this Indian subcontinent in the, uh, you know, 100, 125 years ago, and then in the early 1970s, we migrated to Canada and North America. And then our Central Asian Jamaat came to Canada in the early 1990s. We brought our masala chai tradition with us. And in the same way, just like we brought our chai, unfortunately, we have also brought our nine major risk factors of heart disease and stroke. Uh, and Dr. Kutina, was there anything else that you quickly wanted to share as to why South Asians are at so much higher risk for heart disease and stroke? So I don't think anybody knows the true answer to that. These are, these are research studies that are starting to emerge and there's definitely a call to action for more research. Based on what I've been able to read, just like any other kind of cardiovascular disease is a marriage of genetics and environment, right? And I always tell my patients, heart disease is not just genetics, it's not just environment, it's a combination of both. So there's some thought that, you know, you have individuals that may have higher genetic predisposition to some of these metabolic abnormalities that predispose to cardiovascular disease, such as diabetes, this adverse lipid profile. And then if you take this individual, they may already have a genetic predisposition and you compound uh, uh, unhealthy behavior, such as sedentarism, smoking, although smoking, I understand, is actually a lot less prevalent in the South Asian uh, community as compared to, to white Canadians, for example. But if you compound, the uh, you know the, the the fast foods and the westernized diet and the sedentary lifestyle that many of us uh, uh, you know have adopted in this part of the world a little bit differently. So you put that together and that's kind of a recipe for for heart disease. So the, this is some of the underlying uh, uh, hypotheses, but definitely a lot more studies to be done in this topic, just like more studies to be done in women's heart health, but definitely to better understand the risk in South Asian. Um, uh, Canadians and, and South Asian community throughout the world. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that. I'm just uh, quickly looking at um, some of the questions we have, and uh, we have uh, perhaps two or three minutes to um, discuss them. Um, if there are questions that we don't get to, we will try our best to answer them offline. So there's a question about uh, aspirin, and um, a person's family members, both parents, have been put on aspirin for heart attack and stroke, and it was recommended by their family doctor that they also go on aspirin. What are your thoughts about that, uh, Dr. Coutinho? So the use of aspirin, uh, we are actually very careful uh, in how we use aspirin. Uh, no, no medication out there is perfectly safe. Aspirin is very safe but it's not perfectly safe. Uh, we do know that aspirin does increase a person's risk of bleeding. And that's why, that's why you use it to begin with, to thin the blood a little bit and prevent a heart attack. So we you know over time, through lots of studies, we have learned that you know, we have to weight the risk and the benefit of using aspirin. So uh, which groups do we, everybody agrees that they should be on aspirin, provided of course, there's no allergy to aspirin. I have an allergy, by the way. So if there's no allergy to aspirin, if there's no increased risk of bleeding, individuals that already have demonstrable cardiovascular disease, they've already had a stroke or a TIA, maybe they've already had a heart attack or they've had an abnormal stress test or abnormal angiogram, maybe they they have plaques in the carotids they already know about or, uh, blood, uh, or disease in the blood vessels in the legs. If they already have demonstrated vascular disease, the risks of, uh, of um, the benefits of using aspirin will outweigh the benefits. So those will be individuals that we typically would put everybody on an aspirin. 
if people do not yet have a personal diagnosis of heart disease, uh, like the ones I just mentioned, then very few actually uh, are candidates for aspirin. Those are going to be individuals who, you know, as we can best calculate based on clinical assessments, have the highest risk for cardiovascular disease. And those individuals will then go on to be studied on aspirin. So that's kind of an individualized discussion that people need to have with their physicians. But we certainly do not recommend aspirin for everyone because there, were, there are associated risks with that as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, sometimes symptoms can be confusing. Example, indigestion could be thought of as reflux. Headache could be a migraine. How can we know what symptom is a potential for a heart attack? So the word indigestion is one that I have become fascinated with in this women's heart health world because I have encountered so many women who have used the word indigestion to represent their symptoms. And it's very interesting because if you come to you know, a doctor or nurse and say, doctor, I'm having indigestion, they're gonna take it as face value and think you're having indigestion and, and treat you for indigestion. Um, and sometimes there's no way of knowing. I will tell you though, the majority of women with a heart attack will not have a feeling of indigestion, but some will. And I always try to understand from the woman, you know, have you had indigestion before? And if you have, does this feel like it? Or does it feel something totally different? And many times they say, no, it's totally different, but I just don't know how else to explain it. So if we can make that distinction, uh, that's helpful. Or sometimes they will say, oh yes, I use every time I, I, I eat a very spicy food, I feel this, that's kind of more likely to be true indigestion. So it's, you know, it's a really individualized uh, assessment. And if you cannot tell, I investigate. If if I can, if I do not have a good explanation for that quote indigestion, I investigate for possible heart disease because we don't want to miss uh, a potential life-threatening condition. And I guess the uh, uh, associated risk factors in that uh, person as well, whether they're diabetic or you know they have a family history of early heart disease, putting all those things together would uh, kind of lead one uh, to investigate or not for heart disease. That's right. It's all, it's all part of the, the detective work of medicine, right? It's just to put all the clues together and try to get to the, the solution. And these will be some of the clues that we have to consider as well. All right. Uh, we've come uh, towards the end of our presentation, and we will try and address some of the questions that we haven't got to offline, either by email. Uh, actually, most likely, we have your emails. But uh, now, Thais, uh, you know, life, we don't want to miss it. So what are your actionable items or your take-home messages that you would like to share in conclusion with our audience? So I, the conclusion here is just a reminder that cardiovascular diseases are indeed the number one causes of death among women worldwide. But, so that's the bad news, but eight, the, the good news is that 80% of the time they can be prevented. So knowing the risk factors as we discussed and really engaging in the best lifestyle and the control of risk factors either through lifestyle or medications is really a good way to prevent these conditions. Uh, everybody should know their own risk factors for heart disease, men or women. You should know what is your blood pressure, what's your cholesterol, what's your blood sugar? Are you meeting your exercise guidelines? Are you eating all of your servings of fruits and veggies? Are you maintaining a healthy weight? We should all know all of the risk factors for ourselves uh, and also for the women understand the female risk factors, the female specific risk factors that may apply to them. Uh, and also remember that a heart attacking women may not look or sound exactly like the heart attacks that you have seen on TV or read on books and magazines. So really truly listen to your body if you think the symptoms you're experiencing could be a heart attack and do seek medical attention promptly if you think so. All right, perfect. Um, in terms of South and Central Asians, remember we're all high risk for heart and brain conditions. And as we have tried to reiterate a few times, lifestyle and prevention measures are really critical for do, to reduce the burden of our risk factors. And remember, in the end, your health is your wealth, right? Get screened early and get treated early. All right, so listen, we've come to the conclusion of our program. I really would like to thank from the bottom of my heart, so to speak, Dr. Coutinho for your leadership and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us this evening. And also to Dr. Budwani, uh, you know, for your introductory uh, comments. 
Uh, we appreciate the time both of you have taken from your busy schedules and the times also from your young families to be with us here today. For our audience, uh, our last slide here is a reminder that the access line is available for any questions or concerns you may have. The number is one 536 3599 uh, And we wish everyone an enjoyable rest of the evening. Take care, stay safe, and kuda hafiz. Thank you.